Are you sure you're healthy? This question has become more complex and dangerous over the past 100 years. In 1927, a sinister surgical campaign was unveiled in Britain's Daily Express. Every year, at least 80,000 school children had their tonsils removed due to occasional throat inflammation. They didn't think they were sick, but doctors believed every illness had a lesion that could be found and eradicated. Children's tonsils, which may inflame, become future disease focal points. Thus began a purge across Europe and America. The renowned hunter was Dr. Henry Cotton, who saw mental illness as a demon within. He wielded his scalpel, removing teeth, tonsils, and colons, claiming an 85% cure rate. Cotton quickly became famous, hailed as a pioneer in psychiatric surgery. Cotton's colleague, Phyllis Greenacre, was skeptical of these miracles. She reviewed Cotton's cases at her professor's request and found that behind the cure figures were alarming complications and a 30% mortality rate. Many patients, after having teeth and organs removed, saw no mental improvement and died from infections. With growing evidence against it and the advent of antibiotics, the focal infection hypothesis was abandoned by the 1940s. But medicine's desire to hunt demons has returned in a more sophisticated guise. In the 1960s, coronary artery bypass grafting emerged. The scar on the surgeon's chest was a victory medal against death. But beneath the halo, medical practices spiraled. In the 1980s, a RAND survey found only 56% of these surgeries were necessary. Thousands of patients who could manage their conditions with medication or lifestyle changes are pushed into surgery, facing a 5% mortality risk and significant trauma. Technical capabilities outweigh ethical considerations. From tonsils to hearts, medicine's gaze has always hunted a physical enemy. But history shows that when this gaze is too sharp, it may only see the illusion it desires. Entering the 21st century, medicine's enemy is more cunning. It is no longer a tangible organ, but rather an invisible risk. We're no longer satisfied with merely treating diseases that have occurred, but aim to stop them early. Before the 1990s, osteoporosis threatened the elderly. With bone density monitors and new medications, a standard, osteoporosis is bone density too. Five standard deviations below the young adult peak. Overnight, thousands of healthy middle-aged and elderly women worldwide were labeled potential patients due to a number. They were advised to take medication to prevent a fracture they might never have. Ironically, some medications can cause jaw osteonecrosis or femoral fractures. Soon, blood sugar and lipids were added to the risk list. Pre-diabetes put over one-third of adults in the high-risk group. Cholesterol guidelines kept dropping, forcing millions of previously healthy people to take statins for life. Then, we've developed stronger screening technologies, only to find the body riddled with trivial particles. High-resolution CT and MRI, while searching for lesions, often reveal incidental tumors like lung nodules and adrenal cysts. These mostly harmless conditions trigger anxiety and unnecessary biopsies and surgeries. In South Korea, the rise of thyroid ultrasound screening in the early 2000s led to a 15-fold increase in thyroid cancer incidence, while mortality remained unchanged. Most new cases were overdiagnosed pseudocancers that should have remained undetected. Consequently, many patients underwent unnecessary surgeries and lifelong medication. As medicine's focus intensifies on the brain, this overmedicalization has peaked. Facing Alzheimer's, the US FDA controversially approved aducanumab in 2021. Clinically, it cleared beta amyloid plaques on imaging, but didn't prove to improve memory and life significantly. Meanwhile, 35% of patients had serious side effects like cerebral edema. The FDA advisory committee voted 10 to one against approval, and three members resigned in protest. Yet, it still went on the market, bringing false hope, not efficacy. Patients became guinea pigs in this scientific gamble. 
Overmedicalization has reached the frontier of human emotion. In the past, depressive symptoms occurring within two months of losing a loved one were typically considered normal bereavement. However, the DSM-5, published in 2013, removed this bereavement exemption period. A widow grieving two weeks after her husband's death might be diagnosed with depression and medicated. Emotions are labeled pathological, like hyperactive children as ADHD and adolescent rebellion as oppositional defiant disorder. We reduce life's unhappiness to prescribable diagnoses, only to find ourselves trapped in a cycle where more treatment may lead to more harm. Looking back over the century, overtreatment has never gone away. It may stem from medicine's precious qualities, goodwill against pain, and a desire for certainty. But it cannot escape bias, economic interests, and social pressure. Doctors' eyes, no matter how trained, are mortal, subject to fatigue, wavering, and emotional interference. Today, a new hunter, AI, is emerging. It is emotionless, tireless, and precisely calculates probabilities from millions of medical records worldwide. AI might distinguish which lung nodules are tigers in disguise and which are harmless birthmarks, which need intervention and which are just statistical fluctuations. Theoretically, AI is the ultimate tool to combat cognitive bias and break the cycle of overmedicalization. It provides each patient with personalized, evidence-based advice. Medical history shows a knife can save or create disease. Numbers warn, but also amplify fear. Between what's cured and what should be cured like greed, fear, uncertainty. Even advanced AI may not calculate this ultimate variable. By bravely facing uncertainty, embracing the unknown, and respecting life's complexity, we can truly reconcile with ourselves and prevent treatment from becoming a new disease. Right.